Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. Welcome to Furious Driving and welcome to the 1950s when austerity meant austerity. Men wore grey suits, grey overcoats and nice Homburg hats. And ladies knew their place. And if you knew your place in your company's hierarchy and you were given one of these cars, you knew you'd done something bad. This is an Austin A40 Cambridge, but this is the base of the base models. It does not come more lowly spec than this. However, the Austin A40 Cambridge was a significantly important car because the A40 had been around for some time. This is the third generation of the A40 name. However, for the first time, instead of being body on frame, this thing is unitary construction. It's an all-enclosed chassisless design. How very modern. Let's take a look around. And if you like reviews and look arounds of interesting, unusual cars like this, then please do hit like and subscribe. The A40 Cambridge replaced the A40 Somerset in 1954. This is a 1955 car. And it could not have been more different. First of all, of course, we already said unitary construction. So already it's a narrower body and a lower body as well, but as much room, if not more, than previously because you're not wasting space on messy old chassis rails, you're going straight into, well, a monocoque. You don't waste space with that, do you? It's good. In the design phase, it was codenamed GS5, and it was designed by an Argentinian man called Dick Bursey, who was a bit of a star of the uh, Austin design empire. Now, although it looks, and of course was constructed, very differently from the previous generation, there were a few similarities. It still has a 1.2 litre engine, making 42 horsepower, but now it's a well, an underboard version of the B-Series. It has a new hypoid beveled rear axle as well. It also has the B-Series gearbox, although controlled by this four on the tree arrangement here up by the steering wheel, which is actually surprisingly easy to get used to if you've never driven a column shift before. This driveline had been debuted on the MG Magnet ZA and was BMC's building block strategy for the next two decades. And the front suspension was a modified version of the Somerset's lever arm setup, but now larger, more beefed up, so more resistant to fading and lasted longer. It has cam and peg steering and drum brakes all round, so stopping in a hurry isn't really something you're going to be doing. Fortunately, it's not massively fast either, so it's not the biggest thing in the world. It's not too wandery. It is quite bouncy though. This car actually has more in common with the new A90 Westminster than it does with the old A40 Somerset. In fact, it even uses doors from the, uh, from the Westminster. Nothing else is shared though. Now the gears, or the gear pattern is basically an H pattern that's been turned on its side. So get first gear, push it away from you and up. And pull away. Second gear, away from you and down. Third gear, up to the middle towards you and up. And fourth gear, towards you and down. H pattern on its side, simple. Let's pull over and have a look around the outside of the car and the interior of this thing as well. Right, let's take a little look around the inside of this car. It's horrible out there, so I'm not going to do a big walk around. I'll just do some little static photos for you in a second, just to show you what it looks like from the outside. But it is a pretty little car. The inside, though, is also a pretty little car. It's narrower than the Somerset was, but actually more roomy. We've got these very, very flat doors, which are trimmed in a red vinyl with a little bit of stitching up top to give detail, some uh, chromy trim stuff to make it look exciting and interesting. That's a GoPro turning off. Tiny weeny handle screwed to the top so you can pull the door shut. An opening quarter light. The most minimal door furniture possible. Just a little door release and a little wind. Apparently, the most basic versions of these didn't even come with wind-up windows. In front of the driver, we have something that's a failure as T-shelves go because, well, you're not going to get much of a cup of tea on there. It does have vents in this pressed steel panel blowing up to the windscreen. This is the ultimate in 
well, budget-friendly motoring because this is just one steel pressing with bits attached to it. So we've got the glove box on the left-hand side, big enough for our period correct curved screen blade refills. Imagine having to specify curved windscreen. It's a bit of a fail in terms of a glove box. You don't even have space to hang a cup of tea in there either. In the center, we have space for what could be a radio, but we don't have a radio. We just have a little shiny panel radio size to remind you what you could have had. We do have, though, a very nice Austin badge. And we've got our demister and heater controls either side of it. So that's quite a, a luxury. 1955, we've got the luxury of, well, a heater with demisters and temperature control. And to the right of that, we have the most little tiny weeny basic of instrument clusters you can imagine. We've got three instruments basically. We've got a sweeping speedo, sweeping Thunderbird styly from zero to 90 miles an hour. I cannot imagine this thing hitting 90 miles an hour. We've got a fuel gauge and we've got a temperature gauge and two warning lights, one for the oil pressure and one for the ignition not charging. That is basically your instrument cluster. Not a lot going on down there. Of course we do have our big sprung spoke steering wheel, which is in absolutely enormous, it has to be said, with a horn in the center. Oh, wow. That's a pop that's climbing out of austerity with a plum. Looking to the future pop. Um, behind that, we've got our indicator stalk on the right-hand side. Obviously being British car of the 50s, indicator on the right, but being an Austin car, we do have the light up end to remind you you are indicating instead of a ticky noise. And on the left hand side of course we've got our four on the tree column shift and an umbrella handbrake down here as well so very very continental and exciting. In the centre we do have a number of curiously labelled little pull controls. C is for choke, P is for pork or panel lights, W is for windscreen wipers and S is for start obviously. H is for heat, B is for bonnet, A is for well, auto hold, it's kind of like a rudimentary cruise that just sets the throttle to a, a set position. I won't play with that around these country lanes. But the most significant detail underneath here is, of course, the fact that we have a large sub tea shelf. So if you want your picnic, it's going to have to be here in the under dash area. The whole lot is painted body colour. So in this case, it's a bit like sandy beige on the, uh, the Morris Mini. Um, very similar colour, in fact. I'm not sure what it's called in this car. It looks quite nice with the red interior. This is basically exactly the same colour scheme as my 1969 Morris Mini, funnily enough. In the front, we have what looks like bench seats, but is, in fact, a split bench, so the driver can move back and forth and get the, the right position from the pedals and the steering wheel, so that's all good. And we've got a nice, nicely sized rear seat. Let's go and take a look at that. So again, we've got a little tiny finger pull for shutting the door. I guess people had small hands back in the 50s. A little space age, very cool door release. And of course, a spendy little window pull. No seat belts front or back, you will notice. We die like men in this car, as they say. Very comfortable bench seat. It's actually really rather nice. Lots of legroom, surprisingly large amount of legroom. And if there are only four people in the car, two people in the back, I should say, an awful lot of, well, arm and elbow room as well. Tons and tons of headroom. That is something common to the front and the back of the car in that it is so much space in here. Really, really roomy. For such a small car, it is incredibly spacious. The two previous generations of A40, the Devon from 1947 and the Somerset from 1952, had a curvaceous, swooping fender line that had evolved from the separate wings and running boards of the Austin A10. The new Cambridge stepped away from that completely with an all-new square and modern three-box saloon style, which even had nascent wings at the back. How very mid-Atlantic. The only callback to the Somerset's swipping curves is a pressed swage line running from behind the headlights to the back door. The headlights, slightly cowled by the recessed styling, new crinkle pattern Austin grille, and those winglets do hint at Americana, the exciting new world of the jet and space ages, coffee bars and wimpies that the 1950s offered. The earliest cars only had sliding windows and the petrol filler inside the boot. It was pointed out during testing that the windows were both stiff to use and could slide open, and it was easy to spill petrol into the boot and fill the cabin with fumes. But Leonard Law didn't think it was an issue, so it wasn't until the first buyers complained that these were changed and the filler got its own flap. This new look didn't last long though, as the Farina cars came out in 1958 and the new Italian style took over. The boot was a good size, especially for such a small car, although the boot lip is very high, so it can be quite hard to load. Great for transporting soup without the cans, though. Now, 
the A40 was popular. They sold 30,666 of them between 1954 and 1957 when it was replaced by the A55. However, the A50, which is basically the same car with a bigger engine, did actually sell significantly better because it was just a little bit quicker and more pokey. Driving the car today, it's notable really, mostly for how slow it is. It drives really nicely. Admittedly, it's not as sharp as a modern car would feel. Obviously, it wouldn't be. But it's a really pleasant thing to be in. We've got a little quarter light, so we can get a little air flow through if we want to. But wind-up windows, no radio, but hey, who needs that? Got a nice little B-series to listen to. The brakes, let's do a quick brake check. They bring it to a halt reasonably well. And the, uh, and the column shift is really nice to use. The steering doesn't wander too much. It's just a nice place to be, really. Now this particular car has, must have led quite a life. It was apparently a taxi cab for some time and the uh, odometer stopped working showing 98,800 miles and the odometer stopped working to shy of 100,000 miles. That was 20 years ago and I don't think that was the first time it had been around the clock either. Which kind of goes to show really how well made these things are. This particular car does have a fabulous original patina to it. The kind of unreplicatable aging that you just can't fake. It's so authentically original. Some people might not like the flat paint and the, the chips and things around it, but that's this car's history. That's its story. If you sanded it and painted it, you'd be taking that away. Now you'll notice we are lacking a certain number of mod cons. We've got a central mirror here, but no wing mirrors. They weren't the law yet. No, no seat belts either. Safety very much an afterthought in the 1950s. By about 25 years. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this magnificent little Austin A40 Cambridge. It's a fabulous little thing and it is so much fun to drive. It's not rapid, but it is very, very enjoyable indeed. I've personally loved every minute of this and I don't want to give it back. It's simple, it's basic, it's all you need though. It's fabulous. Anyway, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe and I'll see you again next time driving something completely different.